Are we leaving anything behind us at all? And there's a the thing. I suppose we are, but is it something useful? Is our mark the worn out planet, the plants and animals that no longer exist? Will we be remembered for the sea full of plastic, for radioactive waste, for getting rid of the rainforest, or for something we might build, improve, record, discover? History is short compared to the life of the planet. Humans are here only a couple of million years, and we're only leaving a mark for a few thousand. Ireland was one of the last places on the planet to be populated. There was no Ryanair 10,000 years ago, and people were slow enough to make an impression on the island. The oldest man-made stuff that's there are the mounds and tombs and burial sites scattered around the country. Who put them there and why? Wouldn't you think they'd have enough to do without making these monuments? Surely they were busy surviving, growing a few crops, hunting something for the dinner, minding one another, keeping a roof over their heads. I'm sure the weather wasn't much better 5,000 years ago. But no, something was very important to them, and they took the time to build these yokes. And what's that important? Would the lads over the hill have a laugh at them if their tumulus was only ordinary? No. The big thing was, and is, the next life. No sooner do people discover that they're alive than they want to live forever. It's the birth of religion. So, you'd better do your best for the deceased, to send them into the future. No such thing as heave them into a hole and say it was nice knowing you. Get building. This country has between two and three hundred obvious monuments from that period of history. Neolithic burial sites. Neolithic means the new Stone Age, that means no JCB. Nobody found the plans, so we don't know how they were designed or built. But did you ever see Newgrange? The size of it, the weight of those stones that line it, the amount of soil that covers it. And then the science involved, the fact that the rising sun will shine through a hole over the entrance and light up the chamber more than 50 feet away on only one day in the year, December the 21st, winter solstice. I'd scratch my head a long time before I could design that. And then, as the sun rises on that day every year, its beam comes across the hill behind me here, exactly over the Four Knocks. Work that one out, even though the Four Knocks can't be seen from Newgrange, or vice versa. The Four Knocks were rediscovered only fairly recently. There was a bit of excavation going on down in County Meath, might have been Lock Crew or somewhere like that, and a woman from this part of the country happened to be there and said, There's a load of those things beside us near Clonalvi. In no time at all, the National Museum's main man was on site. PJ Hartnett was the name, and a team spent 1950 and 51 digging there. All looked alike before the dig, little hills with no middle in them, like some kind of clay cake. Nobody had any idea what they were, but most people thought the fairies, the little people, the old gods had something to do with them, and anyhow... How could people have been here thousands of years ago when the world was only made fairly recently with Adam and Eve in charge? But, round the country, the general consensus was, leave them things alone. There'd be nothing only bad luck from interfering with them. In spite of all that, the Bowel PJ and his crew unearthed what turned out to be one of the biggest burial vaults in Ireland, even in Western Europe. Under all the clay was a stone chamber with three recesses, a short passage leads into it, and in the entrance passageway and the recesses were the remains of 65, not about 65 or nearly 65, but 65 people, adults and children, some partly cremated, some not. As well as that, pottery vessels, personal ornaments, pendants, beads and one beautiful deer horn cloak pin. Why leave these valuable items with the dead if not to be useful to them in another life? Everything was moved into the National Museum, and in 1952, a brand new concrete roof was produced. It was covered with clay, the grass grew on it, and it started to look like it does today. Obviously, all these donut-shaped burial sites had roofs in the beginning. The big outfits like Newgrange had stone-built, corbelled roofs that lasted. These other types probably had a wooden roof with a post in the centre, our Fornox tomb had a post hole in the middle of the floor, but a few thousand years makes a big difference to your timber roof. 
Somebody said to me, strange that the Celts didn't continue using these sites. No. These sites were ancient before any Celt came near the place. Whoever built them were a different outfit altogether. And as for remembering what the purpose of them was, did you ever put your keys down somewhere and go back to look for them ten minutes? Where did I put the bloody keys? So, to find out the reason behind the mounds, we really have to guess. They're all sighted just so, and we have to get very astronomical to gain a clue as to why the entrance of the Fornox tomb points almost north. So it doesn't point to any sunrise or sunset or moonrise, but it does point to a stellar constellation, Cygnus or the Swan, and in particular to one star, which is Zeneb. And on the night before the winter solstice, Zeneb will give a position for sunrise the next day. It looks as if the whole island is filled with observatories linked to astronomical events that we still have no idea about. All those zigzag chevron carvings probably represent the relevant constellations. That is, of course, Cygnus and Cassiopeia. Bear in mind, as well, that 5,000 years ago, those constellations were in different positions. Are you confused yet? This is just the technical stuff. Then we have the legends that grew. There was plenty of time for them over the millennia. Most of them feature swans, maybe from that visible constellation Cygnus, always bearing in mind that the Greek name Cygnus hadn't been invented then. Who knows what the Greeks were at at the time. But the bold Angus, who was a god-type, man-type, fell, fell for care, who was a woman-stroke goddess, who generally took the form of a swan when he met her, we're told, at the lake of the dragon's mouth, which could be anywhere in the universe, and they flew back to the Brew Navonia, which is the whole Newgrange campus. Now, the fact that a flock of Hooper swans winters around the Brew lends a bit of weight to this legend, and when swans are flighting, they seem to follow lines that connect our sites like Fornox, Newgrange, Baltray, and so on. Where came the name Fornox? Some say it's from Furconuk, the cold hill. I don't think so. The grammar and the syntax is wrong. In Irish, the adjective follows the noun. I think that quite a few centuries ago, a bit of Irish and a bit of English went into the blender, and out came the term for Knox. Everything points to the fact that 5,000 years ago, Ireland and Europe were lived in by people who knew an awful lot more than we did. Go, you, and find out more, and be sure to tell me about it.